Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name's Nathan Cudell. I'm here in the On One Studios, I'm completely isolated to myself. I'm the only person in the office today, and I've got my, my good friend, Don, Don out there. Hey, Nathan, how are you? I'm doing, doing, doing pretty good. Um, considering the circumstances, I, I got to count my blessings for sure. Um, how about yourself? I'm doing well, uh, aside from the rampaging preschooler in my home office, which is currently on nap time right now, so mm. it all works out. Okay, well, we'll speak quietly then. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, real quick, before we get uh, started, let's uh, do the same rundown you've probably heard if you've been to one of these webinars before. Uh, this is being recorded. It will be posted to the website shortly after it airs. Um, if you have questions for Don or for me, you can use the Q&A there at the bottom of the Zoom window. The Zoom window has lots of different views. We'll be bouncing back between screen shares and stuff. So if you don't see something on your screen, maybe fiddle with your views. Um, before, uh, uh, that's, I think that's my, that's my quick rundown. And, and let me give my, my grand introduction. Today's webinar is going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, if you were looking for uh, some editing or some post-processing, uh, we've got about oh, 500 hours of that on our website. But today's going to be a little different. Uh, Don, the topic is, what if the art of experimenting and pushing your creative limits? And I'll let Don give, uh, give the, grand inter the grand introduction and uh, tell us a little bit more about what he has in store for us today. Yeah, you know, it's a question that I've always been asking myself in my professional career, even unprofessionally, just experimenting and tinkering and reveling in my mistakes. You know, what if you try this? What if you try that? Something that uh, inspires inventiveness and creativity in photography, where so many photographers want to just buy something ready-made to accomplish a task that they have in mind. And then they spend money on X item, it arrives, it does that task, and that's technical. I mean, it's a, like a technician kind of work, right? It doesn't really issue that inspiration inventiveness that I love about photography. So um, we're going to get into this and I don't want to take too much time in this preamble. So let me, uh, let me do a screen share here, if I may. Sure, Don. And while uh, you're doing that, let me go ahead and just uh, give the poll results for those that showed up early. The question was, what photography activities are you doing to pass the time? And the majority winner, or it's a close tie, it's catching up on online training materials and editing a backlog of photos. Um, not many people taking uh, pictures around the house that, that came in low. So maybe we can change, change oh, their opinion I on think, that today. I think we will. I think we will. I'll do a quick screen share. You'll see some behind the scenes stuff, including the email that I logged in here for a brief moment. Uh, and then when I run the presentation screen, uh, you should see that. I'll move the poll out of the way here. There I we see go. It. There we go. So, you know, th this to me is uh, is inspirational. This is uh, I, I want to make people pick up their camera in this time when a lot of people aren't thinking necessarily of that. But I'll give you a little bit of background on me to start. I mean, I, I like to experiment. I like to explore. Right. I, I love infrared photography because it's a quality of light that I can't see with my own eyes. Uh, I love seeing the stars in the night sky. But um, even more so, I've got well, technically three cameras running at this, one on my left and right and one taking this picture, uh, just to illustrate the beauty of the world that we can enjoy in isolation, mind you. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do um, worthy of exploring. And right in my own backyard, I am known for photographing snowflakes and so many more subjects uh, that are so incredibly small, but have detail that is just never ending. So how do we start exploring this? How do we start asking what if, and how do we start becoming that photographer that just finds the universe at their feet to be something very enjoyable? Well, I'll also state that uh, I have a course with On One that uh, during this uh, current uh, world event, um, is free for the public. If you're not an On One Plus subscriber, you can get that. And I'm sure that when we publish this video, the link will be out there. Um, and uh, Nathan, I'm not sure if you could put that in the chat or anywhere else for people to find it right now. Definitely. But uh, that I know has gotten a lot of attention in the last little while. Check it out. I'm really happy with how that content turned out. And now that everybody can can check that out. But so it, in, in this image, we've got a, it's a very simple shot. It's a grasshopper with a, a bare flash on a blade of grass or some such. Now, this is fairly documentary, right? This is what you might go out and just discover. But I want to change that. I want to make that what if question become something like, well, what if we create a subject? 
you know, what if you come across a spider web? Clearly you didn't create it, but uh, I had a spray bottle in my hand. And so what if I spray that spray bottle on that spider web to create some really interesting uh, reflections? In this case, you've got some sparkles from the sun and uh, it's far more dynamic than just a random spider web. And yes, you can find them covered in morning dew. I'm not going to say don't do that and get up early and go and check and see what's out there. Um, but if you're not a morning person like me, then a spray bottle in your hand can be a great tool to create something that is very, very similar. Now, we just came off of the, uh, uh, the winter season where I was doing all sorts of creative work outside. Uh, and I actually had a video published on DP Review TV about how to shoot freezing soap bubbles. Most of the world are beyond that right now, but we'll wrap around into November and December and have opportunities for that again. But the point was, the subject is entirely created by me. Like you, macro photography and the stuff that you can do around home is so much more um, engaging as an artist, right? Because you have to, uh, you have to be both the creator or the sculptor of your subject in some fashion, sometimes more than others, and then a photographer as a second element. And the first part of that is where I find so much joy uh, and entertainment often. You know, hours can go by and I forget about the problems in the world because I'm trying to, well, in this case, I'm trying to get a weevil to float on a flower. And this is actually a, I mean, it looks like magical and otherworldly. I, I use this as the opening image for this presentation, but it, um, it is one of those things that is deceptively simple. Um, this is the setup. This is, it is a, uh, a square uh, vase that is designed for like a, you know, succulents or something like that. Um, and a Gerbera daisy in the background providing the color and just a bare flash just with a dumb trigger that is only sending a, a flash signal. So it's on a manual power and there's a flower. I, I gave the, the green immigrant leaf weevil uh, the benefit of, uh, of going back outside in the garden after this shot. So he's not floating on the flower currently, but um, that was the shot. And there, there was a lot of shots that had gone into that. And, uh, and I had a lot of fun, uh, you know, he, okay. So this beetle, he's got wings. He could fly. He did not fly away. He was as enamored with this scenario as I was. But let's go back to the basics, right? Let's kind of drill down to some of the fundamentals that we might think of when we start to explore this kind of stuff in terms of composition, right? Um, telling a story is paramount to photography. We are visual storytellers. The, the stronger the narrative in, in, in an image, the better that image is going to be. Um, we've got to think about lines and shapes and colors in sometimes abstraction. Uh, and that's much different than other areas of photography. Um, simplify. Photography is a uh, subtractive art, right? We narrow things down. We got the whole universe to photograph. We got to narrow things down to its simplest possible components and, um, and work on that from there, making sure that we have everything that we need to tell that story. For macro work and the stuff that you do at home, typically eye level is the least interesting point of view. You know, you want to find something that is slightly different, higher or lower, usually lower for this kind of work, um, that has a point of view that is so much different from your own. Sometimes, even if the first four on this list don't, uh, don't match up properly, the fascination factor might take over, where it's just so cool and interesting enough as a subject or as an experiment that it engages you on a, an emotional level far more than just a regular photograph would. A, a sense of discovery, I suppose, if you will. So let's talk about a couple of other interesting things here. Um, this is a, uh, a, a ladybug of some sort on a small little plant uh, eating pollen out of a dandelion. I saw these bugs kind of uh, skittering about uh, near a walking path in a wildflower area of my city's waterfront. And I had all my macro gear with me. I was looking for flowers. I found the bugs and I just waited. And I looked at them and I thought, well, uh, well, they're not doing anything interesting, but maybe they will. And I waited for maybe about five, 10 minutes and one wandered over to this flower. So imagine me as a grown adult with a fairly beefy camera lying on my belly in a public space, taking hundreds of pictures of what any passerby only sees as a dandelion, right? They I probably are not making eye contact and wishing I was doing this in my own backyard, which I probably could have, but the beetles were there. And there's a narrative here. 
it hits a lot of those points, being down at eye level, being simplistic, uh, and uh, telling a story. Uh, or, no, that, that's, that, that's the narrative. But um, here is something simple. But in terms of lines and shapes, you know, if I were to take this image of a fly, you know, the eyes are sharp. Sure, we'll talk about focus later on. But um, I could rotate this image 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and it would still be believable because our sense of gravity is very concrete. The sense of gravity for a fly or a lot of these small creatures is far less important. Uh, than it is for us. We've seen flies on walls and ceilings all the time. So uh, feel free to explore them to a different degree. Uh, and another example of that, again, those uh, uh, weevils tend to be uh, bumbly, cute little subjects that will sit in place for at least a few minutes when you're playing with them. Um, this image reads pretty well from this uh, point of view, but it wasn't photographed from this point of view. It was photographed in this orientation. And while that might fill your screen a little bit more while you're watching that and have a, better, uh, a bit of a better impact because of it, it reads better in this orientation. So understand how those lines and shapes and colors, like what if I flip that frame 90 degrees? I can't do that for portraiture or landscape work uh, unless I'm being uh, overtly artistic and don't make a whole series of that. But uh, in macro photography, that's not a constraint of yours. What if you flip the frame 20, 30, 50, 90 degrees or more? Uh, you'll be able to create some interesting uh, images as a result of that. Here's another fun one. Um, defining what your subject is and simplifying to just that subject. Uh, to me, looking at this flower, the subject, uh, after some deliberation, was the dew drops on the flower petals. It wasn't the whole flower. It was those dew drops in that interaction. So I didn't need the whole flower as a result. Um, but the flower was also vibrantly yellow, which to my eyes might have been pleasing, but it wasn't necessarily... Um, part of the subject, the water droplets. I wanted the contrast to stand out, the texture to stand out more than the color. So color can be something that you remove in an element of simplification. Uh, the next images are a, a series of how I might progress through a creative idea. And I, I wanna warn you, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, revel in them because every mistake is a step towards what your next successful image is gonna be. So in this case, I've got some Shasta daisies that are, uh, they're a larger daisy variety with longer stems, easier to get under. Uh, and they're growing up towards the sun. And I thought, well, that's an interesting story. They're growing up. What is the story of a flower? They reach up towards the sun. But this image failed me in the sense that it, uh, it was just a bunch of vertical lines in a horizontal frame, and it didn't really connect with me in any meaningful way. And so if I switch the frame to be uh, vertical, and uh, of course, shooting into the sun always mucks up your exposure, if, even if I correct for that, uh, there's still clutter on the bottom of the frame and uh, some half cut off flower heads. And the sun is too bright, actually. It's so much more powerful than, uh, than what I'm using here in terms of uh, you know, the, the, the orientation of the flower heads and everything else. But what if I could get the sun to be placed behind the flower head? What if I could create an image that has a balance between all of those elements? And there's about 50 images, I'm not sure exactly how many in between these, uh, these shots, but that is the end result of failure, 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 success. I shouldn't call it failures. They're mistakes that are stepping stones towards that success because you have to build up a shot that way and use the knowledge gained at every step of the way to find your final image. And uh, I see an image uh, or uh, a comment in the, the questions here from uh, Ron saying, please talk about the lenses used. I, I don't remember what lens this was. I believe it was a Canon 24 to 105 kit lens. Um, and I'll mention some specific lenses as they come when it's pertinent, uh, when it's relevant to, to the exact image. But uh, you know, this brought me to a realization fairly er early on in my career. Uh, take a look at this bee, this bumblebee flying into a, I think is a, a gas plant flower. And you can see a reflection of the flower in the bee's eyes, but that bee is seeing the world so fundamentally differently than the world that we see with our own eyes. And that realization to me was pretty simple, is that basically as human beings, we are the way we are. We see the world the way that it's useful for us as humans to see, but that's 
not the way the world is. The world is not a static point in reality. Your dog sees the world differently. A bee sees the world differently. Everybody has a different perspective on reality, including uh, your, your fellow human beings. We all see things from a different point of view. And so reality then becomes kind of subjective. And I get into some fun experiments along the way uh, that build up certain scenes. And this was a happy image for me. I just, this was done a few years ago, and I just wanted to make the happiest image in my backyard I could. Vibrant colors, cute bee, how could I put this together? And it took a whole day to make. It's not something that is, uh, that is you know, immediately accessible, but there's a couple of ingredients here that are very important beyond uh, the, the camera gear specifically. Uh, number one, I used a black umbrella. Uh, I used a, an exorbitant amount of gaffer's tape to tape that to a tripod. Uh, a crab clamp might work similarly, but I used what I had at the time. Uh, and the tripod was uh, mounting a flash. And then using that same wonderful gaffer's tape, I've taped a ring flash to a, uh, a uh, garden stake. And you can zoom in on that. You can see a little bit closer what's going on here. A plamp, uh, Wimberly makes the plamp, P-L-A-M-P, which I guess stands for plant clamp. I was never really clear on that. But it's holding a flower in the background. I did have to cut it from another part of the garden. Um, but hey, they're my own flowers. I don't mind doing that. Uh, and a Nigella flower in the foreground. So I've got this whole stage set. And I've got my camera ready to go. And uh, I believe this might have been the Canon MPE 65, but probably set to a one-to-one -one magnification. Any macro lens could make the resulting image from this. And, uh, and now the challenge is, well, where does the B come from? right? Because uh, I, I can't just ask one to become my actor and sign a contract and appear here uh, in exactly the right way. But um, there is a trick and some people might find it against their own ethics. But uh, to me, I, I find this on the side of, of doable is if you spray a lot of flying insects with water, many bees and wasps included, they won't fly away until uh, their wings are dry. So if their wings are wet, they'll kind of hunker down in place. And uh, if you post, uh, stick a twig next to them, they might grab onto that like a, a life raft of sorts. And uh, so I could you know, go around the garden, find a bee on a scalding hot summer day, spray him, give him a nice shower of water, and then position him in place onto that flower. And he would stay there for maybe about a minute before he was dry enough off and would fly away. So, I mean, do as you will to construct the shots that you're looking for and, uh, and come away with something that, you know, I, I've spent entire days making setups like this that don't amount to a single useful image. And embrace that. I mean, just know that at the end of that day, you've gained a lot of knowledge for what doesn't work. I believe um, that it was Thomas Edison that said, I think he was developing some battery technology or trying to at the time. And, uh, uh, and he, he was having multiple failures after failures. And, uh, and one of his colleagues had questioned, well, aren't you upset about this? And, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something to the point of, no, I haven't failed. I've just found 50,000 things that didn't work. Uh, and we're kind of marching down that same road when we're doing some of this uh, experimentation. Uh, to go to the Q&A, uh, thank you um, for uh, 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 Richie uh, or Rich, however you pronounce your name. Not sure where you're from, but fantastic tip about spraying. That spray bottle is that quintessential element uh, in you know, backyard photography. It's used for so many, many different things. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's no success without failure as well. And uh, Stuart Wood said, what's the first thing you're going to do once we're all allowed to go outside again? Um, I don't know, because I have so much fun in my own backyard. I, uh, I'll go grocery shopping. That's what I'm going to do, Stuart. And thanks for being here, man. I appreciate you. Um, That's a good one. Uh, restaurants, would be, uh, restaurants would be nice, too. I'd yeah, like to restaurants would be nice. Maybe a nice date night. Right. Um, and uh, Rick asks, what if you don't have a macro lens? Well, I've got a beastly macro lens and I have multiple of them. I'll show you ways to get close in just a minute, uh, even without a macro lens, so you can start exploring this particular world. Um, but if you do have uh, the ability to get close, the world kind of changes. Um, this hits on that fascination factor. And uh, this is uh, pollen inside of a flower. 
and uh, I forget exactly what flower this one was, but I discovered that every flower has a different color, shape, and texture to their pollen. And individually, they don't necessarily have a story, but together they might. And then I discovered um, the Rose of Sharon flower, which at the time was not always uh, a scary thing. But now it's so reminiscent of something else that we see pictures of in our lives right now. I'm somewhat terrified of this particular photograph, but it's nothing deadly. It is flower pollen. And, uh, and so take that for what it is. On these extreme scales, like when you get to the most extremes, what can you photograph? A grain of sand. This is actually from a, uh, a beach in Oregon um, that is a microscopic garnet. And even a regular grain of sand could be potentially very interesting. Uh, you can get something even smaller, otherworldly even. This is uh, literally otherworldly. This is a micrometeorite that measures probably a quarter to a third of a millimeter across. Uh, and the guy that originally found these, Scott Peterson, uh, who has given me some on loan, started his hunt for these in the gutters of, um, of his own house. Uh, and you know, if, if you can find something as magical as this uh, right at home, then that's fantastic. I'm not sure where this one came from, but it's a slightly smaller specimen. And that is about as extreme as you can get in terms of optics. This is done with a 50 times microscope objective. And um, it's one of the most technically difficult images that I've ever made. It's also a very technical image. There's not a whole lot of artistry within that. But that's as close as you can get with optics. If you want to get closer, not everybody has a scanning electron microscope in their backyard, but this is one of those uh, micrometeorites that I have access to. And um, thank you to the person who wishes to not be named who gave me access to that equipment. But on a more pedestrian level, you can have a lot of fun with a what if game. You might have, as we do, we've got uh, some uh, violets that come up in our yard or pansies uh, on a yearly basis. And this is the center of a pansy flower. If you look at the little frilly bits in the center of the flower, you can see that, that slightly different flower, mind you, looks uh, alien as well. There's so much fun to explore on the smallest scale. You don't have flowers growing in your yard, that's fine. Grab the box of salts in your cupboard count, uh, on, on, in your cupboard or on your counter and come up with something like this, uh, simple grains of salt at extreme magnification or the eye of a fly. Uh, there's just a lot to explore. But how do you do this? How do you get close? Um, well, there's a number of ways. People think, well, macro lens is for macro photography. And you're right, you're, you're not wrong uh, in that regard. But there's a lot of other ways to get close. You can buy a set of close-up filters, uh, really cheap optics. Uh, they usually come in sets of four or five at different magnifications for uh, 10 to $20 online on eBay or other marketplace websites. They're not gonna be great, but just as a, as a lark, something to experiment with right now, it's a great way to do it. If you wanna invest a little more, extension tubes fit between your camera and your lens and they shift the entire focusing range forward so that you can now no longer focus to infinity. Maybe your infinity becomes five feet or two feet away from the camera but the closer focusing distance is much closer. And that's a very good way to do it. You don't have much in the degradation in quality as a result. Uh, a $5 solution can simply be putting a lens on backwards using uh, some machined aluminum that just has a filter thread on one size that matches the filter thread of your lens and a lens mount that matches whatever camera system you're using. And again, five to $10 for that. And a 50 millimeter lens becomes a macro lens. The wider you go, the more magnification you have. And it's a, it's a lot of fun to try to explore that and experiment. And I guarantee you frustration, but get through that. You know, that, those stepping stones towards success, right? Yeah, we talk definitely. About you know what? I was going to jump in and say, Don, sorry to step on your toes, or, but I've got the macro lens for my phone, just attached to my phone. And that's kind of yeah. like a handy thing just to carry around and have. Um, you'll be surprised what you find. A number to... of companies make them. Yeah. A, a moment is one that I have yeah, for that's... an iPhone. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there, but there's, there's tons of brands. There's dozens of them mm -hmm. out there and you don't have to stick to a brand specifically. Yeah. Uh, so, Hey, you don't have your camera or, it, you know, it's uh, out of, uh, uh, it's, it's in need of repair and the repair shops are closed right now. Hey, you can get something for your phone even. Uh, and it would effectively do something very similar to this where uh, this is done with a 24 millimeter non-macro lens. I bought it as a landscape lens. 
I still have it. I rarely use it. But if I put a close-up filter on that lens, nothing else along the way, uh, I can create this. And I've got enough resolution to crop to taste. So this is done with a 24 millimeter wide angle lens, not designed for macro whatsoever, with about $3 worth of glass in front of it. There's a lot that we can do when we simply ask, what if I can get closer? And how do I do that? And at that one-to-one -one macro range, there's so many things that we can explore. You know, in this case, what if I pick this flower from the bush of flowers that it's in and place it into a bird bath two feet away? Because where it was, was uninteresting. But here we've got contrast, both in terms of color, uh, the deep blues and the bright oranges, and in the reflection being darker and the water being darker as well. So there's a lot that we need to explore here. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in the comments, uh, we see uh, you also need a good eye to spot things at a distance. Not, every can, uh, not everybody can see insects quickly. I've spent days looking for things and not finding them. I mean, you don't necessarily need a good eye. You just need the good opportunity to get that to happen. And uh, sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes I get 10 of them in a day. Um, and uh, what Caroline says, uh, do you always use a ring flash on your lens? I'll talk about lighting in a brief moment. We're almost there. Uh, and how's the book coming along? Albert, thank you for asking. Um, with the presses uh, out of uh, commission at the moment and with a preschooler in my home office, I'm a little bit less productive than usual. My wife is uh, working from home as well, so I'm, I'm daddy daycare for the most part right now. It's coming. And if anybody ha that has either uh, backed my upcoming book on Kickstarter or um, has pre-ordered it uh, through my website, which you can do at skycrystals.ca, a uh, small plug there, but... Um, I'll be happy to give you like half the book as uh, as a PDF just to get you through this if you want to uh, to explore that to some degree. Uh, but it's still coming along, and it's coming along very nicely. I'm very happy with uh, uh, with what it's becoming. So, uh, moving on to lighting. You know, this is done with a ring flash on my camera. This is some kind of shield bug on a dead, ugly stem of a flower. Not a very interesting image, but you can make an image much more interesting simply by changing the angle or controlling the light. And so if I were to take that ring flash, still use it, but hold it off camera, off on the side, the image becomes much more dynamic as a result. And I'll use ring flashes for a lot of my work, uh, but not always on camera. Oftentimes it's off camera. Off camera flash, this is done with a uh, regular speed light off camera, but it was also shot with the origin, uh, original Canon Digital Rebel from gosh, uh, 14, 15 years ago now, um, six megapixels, uh, the first sub $1,000 camera, and uh, it was revolutionary, but is sorely outdated. The image still holds up if you use the right photographic techniques and you light things properly. A ring flash on camera uh, would look something like this. Ring flashes are notorious for not possessing a lot of shadows uh, if they're mounted on the camera. And this leaf cutter bee, if you look around, there's no shadows really to be seen, but the image still survives it quite well. Ring flashes will typically have a, uh, a very short throw. They uh, give all of their light out in the immediate vicinity and it falls off quite quickly, which can give you some nice background separation in a lot of different ways. And you don't need to uh, you don't need to get the brand name ring flashes. Canon makes one. I know Sigma makes one. I think Nikon makes a twin light. Uh, I would recommend actually that um, Yongnuo, the Chinese manufacturer, they have their YN-14EX. I think they've got a version two out now as well. Uh, and uh, it's 100 to 125 dollars US, and it's better than the Canon version. Uh, Canon probably doesn't like me saying that, but uh, I've tested them both, and it is better at a fraction of the price. So there's uh, there's some fodder for your creativity. Um, Caroline asks, "What is the piece of equipment called that allows you to put your lens on backwards? It is called a lens reversal adapter. If you type that in eBay, you will find a bunch. Also add your camera mount and your filter thread size. You'll find exactly what you are looking for. Um, 
Uh, sometimes you need to use natural light. I get it. I'm using the sky in this case, and I had to crank up my ISO in order to prevent motion blur. But as soon as you build into um, the, the artificial light scenario, you start to play into magical things. And then there was a moment of discovery within this image. I saw hexagons that I didn't expect to see. The background in behind all of, uh, there's little water droplets in behind that have specular highlights on them that are all turning into hexagons as bokeh. That led me down a rabbit hole uh, to start playing around with um, uh, with the, the the bokeh idea, the concept of uh, of putting things in the background. I actually have a video coming out very soon on DP Review TV that talks all about bokeh and how we can explore that creatively because that's going to be a fun thing that um, uh, that everybody can experiment with. There's so many ways to even like drag out your Christmas lights and that could be a fun thing uh, to have uh, at least a level of creativity with. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's go on to like talking about ring flashes and stuff that I use a ring flash with. I, I I'm known for a lot of my work with snowflakes. That's almost all I, uh, I shoot uh, during the winter months is snowflakes and uh, ring flash is used for that. It's also used off camera for images like this. You can start to see where a ring flash will begin to fail you here. Uh, and you'd have to look very closely to see some subtle rings as reflections on the curves of this water. Uh, now, I should warn you, uh, anything that is spherical, a ring flash is probably a bad thing to use with. That includes the eyes of spiders. So if you have arachnophobia, you just don't like spiders, please close your eyes uh, because uh, you will not like the next two images, I think. All right, fair warning. Hey, Don, you don't happen to have the ring flash nearby, do you? I don't have it nearby. It's not within reach anyhow. Um, I, I do apologize for that. No. Um, but no uh, you can see the effect of the ring flash in the eyes of this, uh, I believe a daring jumping spider. And uh, this I actually found in my office and he was crawling about in front of my desk. And so I put him to work. But um, that ring flash, while it's hypnotic, is also distracting. I didn't really like that look on, on its eyes. Um, and if you were to use an off-camera flash, it looks a little bit more natural. If I were to have put a diffuser on that, it would look even better. But uh, I didn't for that particular case. This uh, zebra spider was uh, a momentary uh, experiment in just changing out one flash to another before he took off with his meal. Uh, if you were to be using water droplets, they're also very spherical, I would not wish it on my worst enemy to have to edit those ring flash reflections out. Um, but they would also get in the way of any refraction that might be coming through, which is something that I love to do. I love to put things in behind water droplets. The more spherical a water droplet is, the better it acts like a lens. And uh, so those water droplets are like tiny little crystal balls that allow you to uh, you know, just Im imagine what's behind it. But the depth of field at this scale, this is one-to-one -one macro lens, uh, and uh, it is, you know, in the realm of just about everything, a regular uh, zoom lens with extension tubes could get you here. Uh, and uh, to go back to the comments for a minute here, uh, if you have a macro lens, uh, this is from Bruce, um, uh, you can add extension tubes to get more than one-to-one. -one. Absolutely, you can. Uh, if you want to know exactly how much magnification you have, the answer to that's pretty simple. Just photograph a ruler, preferably one with millimeter markings. If you've got that, um, know the size of your sensor. Full frame sensors are typically 36 millimeters across horizontally. Uh, APS-C sensors are 24 millimeters across. Just look up your camera and find what that dimension is. And then photograph a ruler at your closest magnification. Count those millimeter markings. And it's simple math to divide one by the other to see how many, like if you can only see 12, then 36 full frame sensor divided by 12 gives you a magnification of three. And so you're at three to one magnification. You'll be able to figure that out pretty easily as you go without having to get into the maths. Um, and uh, can you use a wide angle zoom lens? Well, probably not. Maybe if you put it on backwards, Michael, uh, it's about the only way that you could really get in close so that uh, lens reversal adapter would be useful for you. Um, how do you use a zoom lens for your close up work? Well, some zoom lenses, and you'll see some examples of that, could be very useful if the technology in your camera uh, allows you to do something called pixel shift high resolution mode because typical zoom lenses don't get you into the macro realm, but extension tubes, as it just mentioned, can help with that as well. 
Uh, using a polarizing filter on a macro lens will hang on to the very end of this presentation to see some fun polarizing stuff, which you'll find out there. Uh, and do I use a thickener for my water droplets? I typically use just plain old tap water. And you use a surface for which water will normally stick to a little bit better. Some people will use glycerin in their water, and, and that's fine. Um, and I did some experiments with that at one point or another. Uh, don't make the mistake I did. Um, when you're buying glycerin, buy it in the liquid bottle, not the suppositories. Uh, that, uh, that was a mistake that I, uh, well, I just had to break a bunch of pills apart uh, to get the glycerin that I needed. Um, my wife was laughing the entire time. All right. Uh, so you could put an image in behind instead of flowers. This is uh, one of my most iconic images and sadly also one of my most stolen images over time. I won't get into that now, but if I make a print of that and put it in behind water droplets, then sure enough, uh, you have that image showing up inside of all of those droplets. NASA's public domain archives is a great place to look because I could find this wonderful map of the earth that had realistic cloud cover in the public domain that I was able to print, put behind the water droplet and create an image that looked like this. I was very happy with the results. And uh, indeed it's somewhat uh, indicative of the fragile planet that we live in uh, or live on today. And uh, so there's something iconic about that. But the first time I had put this in play, uh, there was, there was a moment of confusion. I was almost always using flowers in the background behind a lot of this stuff. And I didn't realize, well, I could put something else in behind. And initially it was in behind upside down or upside right. And it came through the water droplet and it flipped it upside down because when things refract, they flip. And so uh, I'll, I'll save you the whole story about that. But, you know, learning moments every step of the way. And as such, there was a lot of learning moments for something like this. I will uh, pull back the curtains and show you how the sausage is made here uh, to reveal something fairly simple that I did on my kitchen table almost at exactly the same time of year as it is right now because there's an Easter basket in the background. That's how I know. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that you can do very simply at home. Uh, it's a blade of grass, specifically blue fescue. Blue fescue is a bluegrass. Most bluegrasses have a powder coating on them uh, that allow water droplets, uh, if I could speak, water droplets to form naturally uh, just by spraying them with a spray bottle. And uh, I've got some third hand tools. One of them is submerged under the water and more tweezer like appendage is put in behind a third hand tool. Just type that phrase or a helping hand tool uh, into eBay or Amazon. You'll find a ton of options, uh, oftentimes for under $10 that would let you hold and position the these things in place. Um, and uh, I, I'm improvising. I'm using an upturned coffee cup to hold things in the right orientation. A bowl that I bought from a thrift store that had a fairly flat bottom. Uh, the setup to create this is incredibly minimal. It's almost exactly the same setup for this, uh, which by the way, the resulting image from this is going to be the cover of my upcoming book. Um, that's just a prairie smoke wildflower seed. Uh, clematis seeds do almost exactly the same thing. Uh, and that's a, a daisy of sorts uh, in the background that I bought from the garden store because it had a blue center to it that turned into this as a final image, just made with a spray bottle. Um, or add to your shopping list some blunt tip, uh, tipped hypodermic needles. The smaller the gauge, the better. Uh, and smaller gauges are bigger gauge numbers, by the way, if you've never uh, looked at gauges. Um, so uh, this is done just by placing droplets with a hypodermic needle on a flower petal and shooting a single photograph of that. Same thing for this. Instead of a flower petal, I'm using a, um, uh, what is it, a tendril from a grapevine, I believe, that was from my backyard. Um, this is that prairie smoke wildflower seed again. And uh, I was kind of going after a dark center in the middle, uh, almost like a black hole with uh, the event horizon and all of the, uh, the accretion disk around it. You know, I'm a science nerd, so I was trying to recreate something like that. I didn't quite get there, but I, I kind of liked the effect. But here's how this shot was taken. You know, there's some very simple setups. There's that same square vase thing that I have. Um, and uh, I've got the lights. These are just simple uh, lighter torches that are aimed exclusively at the background. You'll notice that there's no light on the foreground in this case. A platypod max and some gooseneck arms. I think they've got that whole thing, if I uh, remember correctly, still as a bundle on their website uh, that you can order if you need some tools to play with. Um, and I'm shooting this with a Lumix S1R with their 24 to 105 f4 lens, which is not a macro lens at all. 
Um, but uh, as you'll see in a minute, you can kind of trick it into one. It does cl uh, focus closer than the average macro lens does. There's a lot of near misses or uh, multiple attempts for an image like this. I always repeat the process until I feel like it gets better. Sometimes, you know, I get you know, some that are close, like you can see in this case. Uh, sometimes when I'm trying to create an image like this ant walking across a blade of grass, also blue fescue. Again, it's one of my favorites to play around with. Uh, ants are uncooperative actors. You know, in this case, he's just kind of bumbling about. I've got a beautiful refraction hanging off of his butt uh, and uh, dangling off of his face and kind of stuck between his legs. Uh, not the prettiest of images. Uh, that took about a day to create. Uh, this one was a little bit more organized. I thought, okay, how do I control an ant? Uh, I floated some flower petals that are held under the surface of the water, again, with one of those third hand tools. So the ant can just walk forward and backward across those petals, but he can't get away. He's on like an island of two petals. And I carefully placed the water droplets I was looking for underneath the petal where the ant couldn't easily get to. Um, so, you know, that was a much easier, that took maybe about 45 minutes with years of experience, mind you, rather than an entire day. There's lots of inventiveness. The lens for this, again, was that uh, Lumix 24 to 105. I try to get further away and crop in on higher resolution cameras because if I'm far away, I'll have greater focus. You know, at f8 in this case, I can get almost the entire echinacea flower in focus. If I get closer at f9, uh, almost the same camera settings, I have much less in focus because the closer you get to your subject, the shallower that depth of field becomes. And uh, that becomes a challenge for us because uh, you can get what looks like an alien jaw opening up something out of Star Wars where it's just, um, I think this was a bee balm flower, which uh, uh, you know, becomes much more abstracted on this scale. I, I guess the end result is I can get the refraction inside of the water droplet in focus, or I can get the outer edge of the water droplet in focus, but it's very hard using conventional means to get everything in focus at the same time. That's where techniques like focus stacking comes in, where you can combine multiple images together. And I'm not going to go over the, that entire uh, process right now. On One does have a focus stacking mechanism in their software, which is great for up to about a dozen images, maybe one or two more. Um, and you can start to experiment with that to get a feel for it. And that's what I've done on an image like this using uh, something you can get just about everywhere is um, uh, eucalyptus leaves. I know craft stores like Michael's will sell bunches of eucalyptus. Uh, don't know if that's something that they'll ship through the mail right now, but uh, maybe it is. And uh, the powder coating on that creates very nice water droplets. Our forget-me-nots are about to start uh, uh, popping up in our gardens today. And this is a focus stack of only about three or four frames when normally it would have taken uh, 20, maybe 30 frames to get everything in focus because I intentionally shot this much wider as I did with this shot here. Uh, this weevil let me place a, uh, a water droplet on its head like a flower hat, which was so much fun. But the idea of shooting further away and cropping in in post, I think is something that we all need to embrace a little bit, especially with, when you see a setup like this. Again, I've got this uh, platypod setup and uh, just a, an LED flashlight, just a really bright one, uh, a Gerbera daisy in the background. I love using those Gerbera or Gerbera daisies um, in the background just to refract through. And you see a clothespin that has a uh, uh, what is a, a yellow goat's beard seed, also called salsify. It's a root vegetable that you can plant in your garden. So there's a double benefit there right now. Um, but the original shot out of camera was shot like this. It was shot using the Lumix S1R using its high resolution mode. Now, there's a lot of cameras from Olympus, Panasonic, Sony, and probably more, or at least more will be coming that have these pixel shift high resolution modes that can oftentimes quadruple the resolution of your camera. So I can get a 187 megapixel image I don't need almost 200 megapixels, but the benefit is a single shot. Once I crop it in to the final composition, I was further away, which gave me a greater inherent depth of field. And that meant that I didn't have to focus stack this shot at all. I did some basic levels adjustments uh, uh, in, uh, in on one photo 
uh, raw and uh, cropped it in and the image was done as a result. So there, there wasn't a whole lot of extra effort involved in making this image really shine. I didn't even have to focus stack it, which by the way, with that many water droplets would probably have been a nightmare. Uh, so I'm glad I didn't have to do that. That same high resolution mode you can use. Uh, I, uh, I, I photographed this one in Alaska uh, last year and uh, I didn't have a telephoto lens, but I could intensively crop in on that. I also didn't have a neutral density filter, but the fact of it combining eight separate shots meant that anything in motion would blur, which gave me the effect of a neutral density filter as well. So use your tools either for macro or for other things, but always ask yourself, what if? What if I could get closer? What if I could get farther away? What if I could improve my depth of field somehow? There might be techn uh, technological aids at your disposal um, and, uh, and embrace that, embrace the technology. And there's another just fun trick shot in there uh, about uh, growing my own frost, making your own subjects, putting backgrounds behind. Get inventive. What if you can create something? But focus is also really hard. Now, in an image like this, if my focus was forward or backward by a fraction of a millimeter, I wouldn't have my subject in focus at all. And in the case of this one here, if the eyes were ever so slightly out of focus, you wouldn't see the beautiful uh, mosaic of all of those compound eye colors coming back at you. This looks like a, a sinister alien king guarding his treasure. Um, but it's a technique I call, you know, swaying. You know, if you were to hold a camera steady, no matter how steady you are, you're going to shake a little bit. Your heart's beating, I hope, and you're breathing, maybe. Um, and that's going to shake the camera in and out of focus. But if you add a very slow and predictable movement, uh, it will smooth out those erratic variables and allow you to predict where that focus is going to be. So you can kind of fall into your focus and, uh, and sway into that. And that will likely result in a lot of near misses. That's fine. Your, my keeper ratio is pretty low for macro work because you're hedging your bets by taking shots that might be slightly out of focus. But you might be surprised because those near misses could possibly be used later. Uh, in focus stacking. If you wanted to do that, you don't have to, but you might have those puzzle pieces banked. Uh, if you're just swaying back and forth on continuous shooting, just fill up your camera buffer. Delete images you don't need later. Um, but the more you take, the more likely you will have the focus fall exactly where it should be. Um, 24 shots to get this ant in focus uh, on the tip of a, a leaf here. 16 shots to get this ambush bug in focus. Uh, more or less, I was just kind of moving around trying to find out the right uh, moment here. 46 shots to get this leaf cutter bee flying into a flower. A lot of that is just chaos and randomness and you could add a zero to that number and I might have still not got the shot. There's luck involved in a lot of this work as well. But what if you try? What if you try to get a bee in focus? You'll start to learn the behavior of that bee. How like it might lift its legs up uh, as a precondition for it to uh, be about to fly out of a flower. Um, the more you study them, the more you'll uh, probably get near misses. And those are some of my most frustrating images. Every one of these was almost good enough. The bottom two are the same image just cropped in. Um, and uh, so yeah, uh, to answer your question, Leslie, I do almost all of this stuff handheld. Uh, and uh, that's, you've got a chaotic subject. You can't really button down on a tripod when you're out in nature anyhow. I, uh, I can't remember if I was on a tripod for this one or not. I could have been. I would have been uh, reasonable to do so. Uh, but 25 shots, just finding the randomness in the pattern that balanced itself well. And the final trick here was I actually put my hand out in front of the camera to create a shadow. And that shadow darkened the foreground and gave some level of separation and a level of depth within the frame. So that kind of inventiveness is, uh, is fairly useful for that. Uh, but a lot of the stuff that I do in the field is going to be, you know, I just come across something. I don't necessarily have my whole kit. Frost growing on a spider web I found next to an abandoned gold mine. Uh, I tried to recreate that in my own studio. And yes, you can preserve a spider web. Uh, ask me about that later if you're really curious how you preserve a spider web. Uh, and uh, almost 400 shots required to get this image, which is the biggest snowflake that I've ever seen. Uh, over 3,000 shots to get the earth in a water droplet suspended in midair. Uh, and so that was an interesting concept to explore as well. Uh, my wife was my partner in crime with that, and thankfully she's as stubborn as I am. Um, sometimes images like this, I... Uh, I almost give up on. I was halfway done editing this, but I photographed it in a horizontal orientation 
And it just wasn't grabbing me. This looked like uh, some weird alligator jaw thing, and it just didn't work until I flipped it 90 degrees. And so again, what if you just flip things around? It's abstract, uh, and, um, uh, and, and that's how, how you get there. Um, sometimes you're just looking for inspiration. Um, this is beer bubbles at the top of my glass of beer. Uh, and I saw them and I thought, hey, let's just take this moment and explore beer. Um, so you know, as a professional photographer, maybe I could expense that beer to, to my corporate account, but I got something interesting as a result. And so that what if, what is right in front of you, what is uh, right at home or something that you can get relatively easily. Um, this was a $20 purchase off of eBay. Um, these are diamonds. These are rough, uncut, natural crystal diamonds. And I thought to myself, well, what if, what if I photograph these uh, in ultraviolet light? And this was a fun experiment that I think we can all have a lot of fun with right now. Something that is, it's your own backyard. It's something entirely different. And, uh, and, and this was my setup. This looks like something out of a mad scientist laboratory. I consider myself a mad scientist some days. Um, but if you can't see it, there's these tiny little diamonds, this tiny little row here with a bunch of LED ultraviolet lights um, that are placed around it. And uh, yeah, it uh, is not big. And I'm only at about a three times magnification and I can just about fill the frame with this. So extension tubes on a regular macro lens with a bit of cropping can get you there. The ultraviolet lights, I've modified my own flashes. If you're not that adventurous, buy anything that has the Convoy name on it, C-O-N-V-O-Y. There's a bunch of people that use that name. They're usually manufactured out of China, but the quality of those lights uh, is generally pretty good. I've got a good number of them. Uh, and you can see there's one, two, three, four of them at use, plus some other accoutrements in that image. But those lights work well. So what I'm getting at is these diamonds lit with regular light look like this. But diamonds often have impurities in them. And those impurities will often fluoresce under ultraviolet light. Now, grab your uh, husband or wife's ring or jewelry uh, that might have had a, a diamond in it and see if it actually fluoresces. A lot of them do. And uh, I made this rainbow assortment of different diamonds that fluoresced in slightly different colors based on their impurities. Now, natural elements like diamonds, uh, inorganic material, a lot of minerals will fluoresce, but organic material does too. Uh, this succulent that I bought from South Africa, specifically as a bulb because somebody told me it might fluoresce, I grew for about 10 months and then voila, it turned into an aurora of light when I lit it with ultraviolet light. It was amazing. I had so much fun with that. Uh, this time of the year, our snowdrops are blooming and uh, uh, one of my wife's favorite flowers. But if I photograph a snowdrop in ultraviolet light, bam, we've got this crazy array of almost electric lines running through it. Uh, so much fun to have this time of the year uh, out in our gardens. Uh, later in the summer, of course, we get a swarm of cicadas around. Uh, they're relatively docile. Uh, you can pick them up. I almost stepped on this guy. Uh, he was on my driveway. I picked him up and I put him on a uh, filter that acted like a mirror. And uh, I just asked myself, what if? I mean, I know other things glow. What, what does a bug do? And I was astounded uh, as, uh, as I saw this. And it's like a science fiction shade of blue. It was phenomenal. I had, uh, I had no idea it was going to be that cool. The same thing for this, um, this sweat bee. Uh, they were lying in a flower on a cold morning. And I brought all my gear outside and took this image of it on a flower. There's the whole setup. That's the resulting image. I brought out a bunch of black felt uh, to make shade and uh, to, to really darken things down so the only light was coming from my ultraviolet light sources and there was that bee sleeping in that flower i breathed on him and the hot air from my breath uh, gave him enough to wake up and start puttering around the flower when i started taking that picture uh, we've got bleeding hearts that are going to be blooming soon they perform wonderfully uh, i often find these in the flower stores or you can buy them online ornithogallum dubium flowers uh, any succulent is bound to create some magic. And our maple tree is about to give off a show. Maple flowers tend to be just brilliant. Um, now, you don't know, have a maple tree nearby. We've got one in our front yard. So I'm lucky enough to have that and I'll experiment with it again soon. Also, this time of the year, uh, hellebores, Christmas roses, um, they fluoresce like crazy. I put an extension tube on a fisheye lens, which shifts infinity focus to the front element of the lens. 
and uh, and that ended up being uh, this as a resulting image. Um, so that was just a heck of a lot of fun experimenting. You'll see a black cloth in the background uh, that was sprinkled with some fluorescing pigment powder that is typically used in novelty makeup around Halloween. Um, and uh, so I get all sorts of unusual elements that, uh, that can uh, make a, a fun image. And, uh, and there you have it. Another fun shot to make here. This, uh, uh, this is a, uh, what is a passion flower? And a passion flower in, uh, in ultraviolet fluorescence. Again, when I'm taking the image, uh, I turn off the lights and I drape things so that there's no ambient light whatsoever. And I'm hitting this with ultraviolet flashes, but those flashlights would work as well. It's a relatively static image. Uh, and it turns into this. It's amazing what you can find. If you've got succulents around or you can find access to them. Um, this one in regular light, eh, it's okay. Uh, in ultraviolet fluorescence, just, just sparkles. I mean, it just transforms itself into something from Avatar uh, or Ferngully or whatever kind of small magical world you can uh, imagine. Uh, in this case, I was able to wrangle a jumping spider to pose on a, uh, an orchid, a lady slipper orchid that we have growing in our yard. I picked one of them and brought it into the studio where it was dark. And that spider was uh, easy enough to wrangle. He was walking all over the place, finally got him in a good spot. Those flowers, by the way, normally they look beautiful, but they're not fantastic. They're great, but they're not that great um, uh, as a photographic subject. But in ultraviolet fluorescence, man, they just, uh, they become something else. And so this is a world that we have all around us. Just requires a different light to, to view it. And, and just a different light, by the way. Fluorescence is when, uh, is when you have ultraviolet light hit a subject. That ultraviolet light excites electrons to orbit in a higher orbit within that, but they decay almost immediately back down to their native orbit. In doing so, they give off energy in the form of visible light. So you're using your regular camera and your regular lens to capture visible light that only exists because ultraviolet light fluoresces the subject to give off visible light as part of the process. Um, Here's another fun experiment, combining the inorganic and the organic together. And so this is a mineral called cerocyte. It's a lead ore that fluoresces almost the same color as the sun. And I got some uh, Irish moss flowers uh, that I put on clamps all around to stage as if, you know, as if the sun went out, but this was glowing and all the flowers, like those daisies growing up towards the sun at the beginning of the presentation, uh, were crowding around as if it was the source of light and they were growing in towards that. And so you can build these narratives, you can construct images as a result from that. It's all where your inventiveness takes you and asking, well, what if? What if this story could be told? What if I took one of those mineral samples? This is hackmanite. Uh, and uh, hackmanite, again, a lot of fluorescing minerals out there. There's tons of it. Uh, what if I were to take that and uh, wrap a grapevine around it and get one of those weevils to pose like it's a beating heart of nature and he's kind of checking the pulse and the wispiness that you see around there, fog machine. It's a simple fog machine adding a whiff of fog into the frame to add some atmosphere to it. Uh, I get bored sometimes in my studio, even when I'm not locked at home and I come up with these fun ideas. Uh, one time abroad, my wife and I were, uh, we were at, uh, a cafe in Istanbul overlooking the Bosphorus, uh, beautiful location. We ordered Turkish coffee as one would at a cafe in Turkey. Um, and, uh, I noticed these crazy colors in the surface of the coffee. It was wonderful. It was great. Uh, I took out the camera before I took a sip and these patterns were caused by thin film interference, which you can find in soap bubbles. You can find it in ink from fountain pens. You can find it in all sorts of stuff. Thin film interference is a lot of fun to explore. Um, and there's a partner to that called cross polarization and biofringence, which I made these in my studio with household ingredients uh, just in the past few weeks. Images like this, beautiful and abstract, they can be done without a lot of gear. Now I, I have a lot of gear and so I'll show you kind of the setup. I'm using a microscope objective here, uh, probably a five times objective that you're seeing or a 10. So you can get that with the Canon MPE. The Liowa has the 2.5 to five times. Uh, Mitacon has a one X to five X macro lens. There's a lot of lenses that can get in that range now uh, without you having to break the bank. Or if you want to go out and buy a microscope objective, they're only a couple of hundred dollars for a good one uh, and even less for a 
cheap one to play around with. All you have to do is mount that on a 200 millimeter base lens. If you already have a 200 millimeter lens, you just need a, a filter uh, thread uh, step down adapter from whatever your 200 millimeter lens filter thread is down to whatever the microscope objective is. Uh, they're often 25 or 26 millimeters. And that's it. Set the focus of the lens to infinity and uh, start having fun. I'm on a focusing rail here uh, and I'm using polarizing filters, one on my light source and one on top of the uh, little microscope slide. If you don't have microscope slides, just take a picture frame apart with a four by six piece of glass. You can do exactly the same thing. It's not anything special. Um, and that results putting the polarizers in opposition to one another into these crazy abstract patterns that are just absolutely fun to explore. Uh, and, uh, and I have a ton of fun doing that kind of work. So whether you are doing a uh, simple shot of a refraction, this is a daffodil petal. Again, the daffodils are just coming up in our garden. So that's a, a subject that is right around the corner. Uh, or you're just coming across a butterfly in a flower and you have one moment to take that shot and that's what you get. Um, well, that serendipitous one moment, one snap, uh, you tell a story, that happens sometimes. Oftentimes I like to construct things along the way. Uh, but in any case, I'm always asking, what if I can get the shot? What if I can experiment? What if I can make a mistake? Because when I make a mistake, that's when the magic happens. And uh, that is the art of experimenting and pushing your creative limits. And every one of those images can easily be made on your kitchen table, in your backyard, without a lot of, uh, uh, of equipment. Yes, if you don't have a macro lens, there's ways around that. There's so many things you can explore and you can do. Um, and to go into the final questions here, uh, Carolyn said, uh, repeat what you said uh, to increase the millimeters of your lens. Um, well, uh, maybe I had mentioned how to increase the, uh, the magnification of your lenses. Uh, and that would be done by uh, by adding extension tubes. Extension tubes fit between the lens and the camera body, and they allow that closer focusing distance to shift even closer. Uh, I typically find extension tubes work best on lenses anywhere between 70 and 120 millimeters. That's kind of the sweet spot, but I've used them on 180 and 200 millimeter lenses as well, and they'll still work. The effect is just a little bit uh, more limited from that. Uh, Stuart Wood asks, how do you preserve a spider web? Fine, I'll go there. Um, make yourself a wood frame, like the kind that you would stretch canvas around, like a 12 inch by 12 inch frame is fine. Uh, in the fall, when a spider has made a big ornate web, just push the wood frame against the web enough that it unattaches from whatever it was attached to. The anchor lines will attach into the grains of the wood frame, and now you can take that inside and that spider can go and make a new web. Um, that, maybe that's mean and unethical to the spider, but then you would have a web that you can take inside and uh, put in a sheltered place. Uh, uh, Gabriel says, the whole idea is awesome. Still have a job and I'm hoping to be able to stream it later. Thanks to everybody involved. And, and thank you, Gabriel, for being here uh, and for uh, at least chiming in at the end. And I want to thank On One for putting this together, making me have the opportunity to do this. Uh, Harmony says, thank you for the inspiration to keep learning and practicing and keep learning. Really, the trick here is to keep learning, to just make magic with all of this uh, and make mistakes because you can't make magic without making mistakes. And I want to end with one final experiment here. And uh, I don't know, Nathan, you, you might get mad at me uh, for making people want to cross their eyes. But here's a fun thing you can do right at home. Um, so uh, you might not be able to do it now, but uh, if, you, if you kind of move back from your screen, if it's a large monitor that you're watching or move closer to your phone, cross your eyes so that you see three with this. Not so that you see four, which would be double vision, but so that you see three. And uh, you'll see this image in stereoscopic 3D, which is something that just adds an entirely new dimension to everything that you're looking at. Um, I don't know if anybody can get this to work now or later, but it's actually really easy to do. Uh, I'm gonna do another example here, one more, uh, where this was not shot with any special lens. This was shot by putting my camera on a focusing rail, but putting it horizontally so that instead of moving forward and backward, it would move left and right. And moving left and right, I can shift the camera 
take a picture, shift the camera, take and take maybe five or six pictures and find exactly how much depth is going to work because then I would have a stereoscopic pair. When I have exactly the same subject in front of the camera, but the camera is in two different positions horizontally, you can start playing around with 3D. Maybe that's way too geeky. Maybe I should just kind of like put on my propeller hat uh, for talking about that type of stuff. But I just find it fun. And it's something that you can use your existing equipment to explore and have a lot of fun and difference with. And there's one more just for good measure because, hey, why not just explore that? Because there's just so, so much uh, to, to have some fun with. Um, and uh, yeah, there's uh, a, a lot of people chiming in. I'm not going to get to everybody that says thank you for the uh, uh, images and the wonderful ideas. And if you don't have the ability to cross your eyes, but you do happen to have some stereoscopic glasses, those anaglyph red and blue glasses handy, then, uh, then you might be able to just take a look at this one when we sign off on the video, put those glasses on and just see it in 3D and smile because you too can make this at home in our current crisis and just be happy, have fun. If you got kids, they love this stuff. Uh, and I look like a total dork right now, so I'm taking this stuff off. But I appreciate everybody for being here and thank you so much for attending this webinar. Wow. Thank you, Don. That was, that was very inspirational. And uh, I can't say enough about uh, the presentation. Thank you, everyone that attended. This webinar was recorded and will be posted to the website here shortly. And um, again, Don, thank you so much for coming. I'll leave it to you to sign off. My pleasure, Nathan. Thank you. And thank On One for putting this together. And also a reminder right now, that course that I'd recorded on macro photography, I believe it's 10 or 12 uh, different mm -hmm. lessons, is available for everybody to stream. On One Plus subscribers still have the luxury of downloading the videos. But if you want to get inspired beyond what we've seen here, take a look at that course. You'll see me in the field working on things, in the studio working on things, coming up with ideas and continuing to ask that question of what if and how we can apply that to our creativity, especially when a lot of us are stuck at home. So thank you on one. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, and get out there and, well, or stay in there and, uh, and get creative, everybody. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, Don.